Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this evening's keynote entitled Taking Care of Matters by Andy Gork, director of Carmen D. Gork. Uh, Andy studied architecture at the University of Sheffield and worked at Hathaway Tompkins and David Chipperfield Architects before establishing Carmen D. Gork in 2006 with uh, Kevin Carmen D. Andy lectures internationally on the work of the office and has taught architecture at schools including the Bartlett School of Architecture, the Royal College of Art, the Porto Academy uh, in Porto and Versailles, the University of Stuttgart the Cornell, uh, at Cornell where he was the Gensler Visiting Design Critic, at the GSD where he was Visiting Critic, and at Yale School of Architecture where he was the William Henry Bishop Visiting Professor. He has been a Visiting Professor of Practice at the University of Sheffield since 2014 and an External Examiner at the London School of Architecture since 2021. Um, Thank you very much. We look forward to your lecture this evening. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, title, Taking Care of Matters. I'd like to talk about the process of making two of our projects, which are designed to take care of things in unconventional ways. Taking care of cultural artifacts, taking care of buildings themselves, and taking care of material resources. The first is a conservation in action project designed to save a historic house. The second project is for a slow evolution of a small city museum. I'd like to illustrate how the research and outcomes from one project influence and inflect the process of another. I'd like to begin to begin with, I'd like to outline some of the themes that underpin these two projects and the studio's process in general. Permanence is a privilege. Since the beginning of our practice, we have made projects with intentionally very short lifespans, built speedily as a prototype or one-to-one -one model of a building, then removed, leaving only stories and images as their legacy. We've also made projects which intend to be permanent and whose very purpose in presence is to exist in memoriam. Endurance and resilience are typically considered as venerable attributes of architecture, although they cannot always be taken for granted. Permanence is a privilege often bestowed on a building outside the architect's control. We're fascinated by the way that buildings, places, and objects are constantly at the mercy of time, wear and tear, use and misuse, and subject to transformation in physical form and in the realm of images and ideas over their lifespans. Retain, reuse, reinvent. Contemporary societal and environmental challenges have led us to consider beginning with what we find, adapting and transforming to give new purpose and identity to buildings and objects. We can no longer rely exclusively on the idea of virgin territory and or resources, but instead, instead find optimism in the physical, cultural, and social continuity of existing conditions as starting points. Accumulation. Ideas and physical evidence of process and making continually accumulate and add up. Referencing quotation and precedent is often the starting catalyst to any new project, as novelty is all but impossible. Making and reflection always go hand in hand. Nothing is ever discarded, but retained, reused, and reinvented again and again. Atmosphere. We're fascinated by architecture's capacity to provoke an emotional reaction to buildings and the way that they are made. References, which are initially brought to inspire the image of a project, constantly come in and out of focus through its implementation and in turn provoke new readings and misreadings in the foreground and background of experience. The atmosphere of a room is never static, but dynamically changing over the course of every day and through the gradual accumulation of use and time. 
artists and architects. We've collaborated with artists ever since the beginning of our practice. Whilst artists have a very different and more direct relationship with their work to the process of designing architecture we're experienced with, working with artists reveals important research for our practice, showing us new ways of perceiving the world around us and making sense of our times. Singular and collective. Architecture is considered simultaneously for the one and the many. The needs and wants of the individual are balanced and calibrated with those of society at large. We consider the constituency for our projects to be the commissioners, the end users and the passers-by for now and to, for generations to come. Room city, city room. We're interested in making every room count in elevating the qualities of the ordinary every day as well as, as well as the special. We see rooms as building blocks which are in turn connected to one another and also to an experience of the wider world by architecture as a frame for making place, purpose and architecture itself more vivid. Buildings and their facade link rooms with the world outside through the disciplined and careful composition and proportioning of structure, spaces and materials. Intimacy at scale. We value buildings that are not hermetic, frictionless objects, separated from their context and the, the stuff that they are made from. We admire architecture which at all scales, from detail to master plan, is imbued with qualities of materials and their processes in order to avoid a sense of distance and detachment from the witness or user and with the intention of grounding a connection between building its time and place. Designing with climate in mind. With the increasing evidence of an accelerating climate crisis all around us, we seek to build as like-mindedly as we can with local conditions and to make the most with what is already there or close to hand. We look to the wisdom of existing architecture and admire, and admire the enduring ideas and forms of vernacular architecture and construction, as well as the benefits of technology which enables architecture to leave as light a footprint as possible. Abundance. Contemporary society has become over-dependent upon and indeed greedily relishes abundance. Abundant consumption is all too convenient and based on misguided reliance upon abundant and endless energy and resources. As architects, we are compelled to exploit abundance in construction. But as, the indus but as industry professionals that can have a huge influence on the environment, uh, environmental impact of construction, we must increasingly consider what is abundant in terms of the regenerative material and energy resources available. Wherever possible, thinking of adaptive reuse as the first option for building and materials rather than beginning afresh. Not forever. As, I've, as, as I have mentioned, we are very familiar with making projects with deliberately short lifespans. But this project is about a building that is coming to the end of its life through raf rapid deterioration because of a fault or a mistake in the design of the construction. The project is concerned with us acting as custodians of an architectural masterpiece, Charles Rennie Mackintosh's Hill House. Without the intervention of our project, the house would perhaps already be, end, be beyond the end of its life. It's set within the context of the second devastating fire that has all but ruined Charles Rennie Mackintosh's Glasgow School of Art. His Hill House, probably one of the most important 20th century buildings in the UK, was suffering from a different fate. After 12 decades of being beaten by driving rain, it was dissolving like an aspirin, to the point where it only had two more winters of harsh weather left before it was beyond repair and may have had to have been demolished. The house is owned by a charity, the National Trust for Scotland, who take care of a variety of natural and built heritage, from coastal walks and mountain ranges to ancient castles and monuments. They rely on revenue for visitors to be able to continue to take care, long-term care of their assets. 
The hill house is the jewel in their crown and is their most visited property, but it is one that is very in a very fragile state of repair. The way to remediate it is certainly not straightforward and is subject to huge debate amongst academics and Charles Rennie McIntosh experts. Our project creates a unique instrument in this conservation process, in action process. Its intention is to stop the clock, halt the decay, and buy thinking time about what to do next. During this indefinite period, our project allows visitors to keep visiting and be brought into the debate about how and indeed why we might conserve our built heritage. To appreciate what's going wrong with the house, we first need to understand its physical and historical context. The house is located in Helensborough, 30 kilometers northwest of Glasgow, on the west coast of Scotland. It was first planned as a dormitory town, away from the pollution of industrial Glasgow itself. Helensborough has a fascinating history, which could be the subject of a separate talk. But the Hill House is located at the very limit of a 19th century gridded town plan on a hill, not unlike Glasgow itself. This is the view from the top of the hill, stood beside the entrance to the Hill House and looking back towards the River Clyde and the industrial heartland beyond. The house, would imagined, the house was imagined as a belvedere by Mackintosh, taking into account the very best views of the town and the landscape beyond. The house sits in landscape that gardens designed in collaboration with Margaret MacDonald, who rarely received the fair credit for the creative partnership with Macintosh. The house is an imaginative composition of forms, blending references of traditional Scottish baronial architecture with emerging modernism from some Eastern and Southern Europe. Encapsulating all of these references is a stiff concrete render, buttered all over the top of the walls and parapets to create an image that is simultaneously figurative and abstract. The image of the building relies on this heavily edited grammar of construction, no coping stones or dressings to protect the building from the unrelenting weather. It's interesting to compare the Edwardian house in the background of this image that was built at the same time in an arts and crafts style. It boasts, more, four, it boasts far more robust detailing in its roofs and eaves, protecting the lime render effectively from the weather. Macintosh bet against this wisdom in creating the image of his architecture. The rather austere exterior belies the rich interiors with a radical organization designed bespoke around the patterns of living for the client publisher Walter Blackie. There is a rich mixture of interior spaces, dark broody spaces such as the library for Mr. Blackie and light ethereal spaces for entertaining for Mrs. Blackie. The signs of prolonged water damage inside and outside are now severe and scholars have debated for over 40 years at what to do best. The root of the problem is in the way that the house was built from local sandstone and brick rubble and then encapsulated with a new material that Macintosh borrowed from the emerging modernism of Southern Europe, concrete render. This was smothered all over vertical and horizontal surfaces. However, the material was brittle and not suitable for the climate of Glasgow. Water gets in behind the concrete render it freezes, cracks the render, more water gets in, it doesn't get out, and so on. The Hill House is a 120-year-old sandstone sponge. So, what to do next? Typically, this is the image of a conservation project. The owner protects the asset with temporary scaffolding construction and makes it a safe working environment, shielding the weather and also keeping visitors away from, for the duration of the works. In 2017, the custodians of the Hill House ran an international architectural pro competition to run alongside a conservation program. The original idea was to fully scaffold the Hill House, whilst a visitor's pavilion would provide an experience of Macintosh on the garden lawn in front of it. We disagreed wholeheartedly with the premise of this idea from several points of view, but fundamentally that quarantining the house for up to 15 years of repair would make people lose interest in coming to Hill House. 
Since the beginning of our studio, we've been captivated by temporary projects, and indeed projects um, using scaffolds potential to build quickly and inhabit itself. But if one looks at the impact of scaffolding structures, temporary works are extremely dense. The scaffold applied to Hill House would have decimated the garden landscape, as well as obscuring the house from view indefinitely. Scaffolding structures would be sub subject to rental agreements, and we worked out that a scaffolding would actually have costed more than a permanent structure in only three years. Our proposal instead was to build a simple steel-framed structure as a field hospital to take care of the patient inside. This structure, built quickly, could give immediate protection to the house. Our proposition was to stop the clock, halt the decay, and buy time to think about what to do next. The architectural idea was to create an enclosure that delivered a solid roof to keep the rain off, supported by a skeleton of steel. Inside the skeleton, we introduced the visitor facilities of tickets, cafe, and toilets, and some walkways that allow you to explore the house inside and out in new and unusual ways during the construction. We're inspired by this temporary project by House Ruka and Co. from 1971, which creates a similar idea of a displaced environment around Mies van der Rohe's Krefeld Villa, starving the architecture of di direct daylight and context. We're fascinated by the way that, without reference to the wider environment, the project appears now not as a building but as an uncanny architectural model. Somehow its atmosphere heightens the awareness of the qualities of the architecture inside in ways that wouldn't already ordinarily be possible. We also saw the Hill House project like the mechanistic potential of Cedric Price's Fun Palace, where the subject is the interactivity of the visitors and the structure. The architectural ideas about putting the visitor at the center of the experience of the conservation and creating a very special enclosure around the perimeter. We wanted to find a structure that was worth expressing and was able to be quickly built by bolting it together. And we're fascinating, fa fascinated by the directness of provisional structures like pylons. We wanted to express the primacy of this framing as a piece of infrastructure to contain the building inside and wanted to make the project from the fewest amount of parts to do the job. The completed project has a very unusual presence, created by the frame-like structure and diaphanous wall in complete counterpoint to the mass and solidity of the hill house inside. The wall is in fact a membrane of stainless steel chain mail um, links woven from uh, 43 uh, individual, 43 million individual links. It is a very con unconventional choice for a building material, but enables us to achieve a unique micro environment. The wind can whistle through the veil in order to dry out the hill house, but the rain loses momentum around the chain links. The primary structure holds sheets together of chain mail, which are carefully stitched with uh, stainless steel uh, wire chases, traces. The presence of the mesh comes in and out of focus from various dif distances and creates views to and from the house. Unlike glass, it is 99% optically clear because it is only 1% solid material, but allows sufficient blockage of UV to enable the interiors to be experienced in daylight conditions more often. The visitors can experience the interiors throughout the conservation project outside, however long it takes. And outside, the visitor can embark on a promenade all over the structure to gain unique experiences of the Macintosh house. On walkways that are threaded into the superstructure and coil up, around, up and around the house, leaving ample space at ground level for important conservation activities. The original planting that Margaret MacDonald designed is kept alive by irrigation from rainwater captured by the roof. The chain links are sized to allow bees to pass through to the membrane and cross-pollinate the plants. And the visitors are able to witness at close quarters exactly how poor, st poor state the construction is actually in. 
See how the lack of copings and flashing is causing the decay. And visitors have a roof's eye view at the same time as watching, a roofer's eye view at the same time as watching other visitors. At the very top of the 25 meter building in the air, there is a unique belvedere to look out at the Western Isles of Scotland. The dark, tains, the dark stained timber box is intended to be uh, barely visible for tickets and uh, cafe, since the figure of the house is intended to be the main focus. The project is first and foremost a shed shelter for the conservation project. It also provides full visibility of the works throughout the lifespan of the project. And the structure even seems to emulate the graphic atmospheric quality of Macintosh's silhouetted drawings, something we can't quite claim we intended or predicted. The project has enabled an important work to begin, and the Getty um, Foundation have been monitoring the progress of drying out the house, which is happening quicker than expected. Infrared imaging shows us where water ingress is still present outside as well as inside. And enabling the academics to debate what happens next. The conservation is not so much a practical dilemma. If it was that simple, the National Trust for Scotland would already have bought the right tin of paint or render to repair. It is more a philosophical question of what to do uh, next for the best. Do they repair with authentic, mater authentic materials to Macintosh's vision with the expectation that the house will suffer the same fate in another century's time? Or do they repair with new technology which would be inauthentic? There's a further dimension to the di um, dilemma. Since the completion of the temporary project, the Hill House has received four times the amount of visitors than before um, the box was there. By buying time to consider what to do next with the ensuing repairs, they also have a new dilemma about whether the box itself should stay forever. Rubbish buildings. The second project is for a major renovation and extension to Design Museum Ghent. It's also about taking care of design culture, but also about considering how we might extend the life span of buildings old and new, of those that are in good condition and those that are to rubbish quality. The project is currently under construction and would and could have only happened with our brilliant clients, Design Museum Ghent and So Ghent, and our partner architects, Atoma, Rest and BC Materials. Um, as the title of this chapter suggests, the project investigates what we can do with our waste processes as part of designing the architecture, from a city scale to a building scale to a material scale. The site for the project is in the UNESCO World Heritage City of Ghent. It has a wonderfully ad hoc, picturesque quality. Our site for the project is in the center of this shot, with a cluster of historic buildings around a courtyard garden. Hoos Leighton, the tall building on the right-hand side, built in 50, 1577. Hotel de Cornic on the left-hand side in 1755. And a 1992 wing behind a facade retention completes the courtyard garden. The gap plot in the foreground will be the center, will be the site of the new addition. The museum has been hosted by these buildings for just over a century. And it's fascinating to see over time how these buildings have shaped the museum. And in turn, the museum has reshaped the buildings. The museum began with a society of decorative arts collectors occupying Hotel de Koenig, a grand 18th century house. There's a nice symmetry with domestic objects being displayed in the context of domestic rooms. Gradually, the museum's interest grew into more applied aspects of design, including architecture and urbanism, and the museum became far more engaged with the projects about the wider city of Ghent. In the 1990s, the museum had a major expansion of the collection to be more internationally focused, and the museum 
built a set of large galleries to show permanent collections and exhibitions. The vision for this expansion vastly outreached the budget, and some of this vision seems extremely outdated and environmentally misguided by today's standards. Few contemporary museums would build a fully glazed garden atrium over a lecture theater and a fully glazed south-facing gallery facade. The gap plot has remained empty for 30 years, and the museum has fallen sh short of key facilities, including permanent toilets, which this folly brings attention towards. With the collection and the visitors in substandard con conditions, the incoming museum director, Catherine Laporte, gave a new vision for Design Museum Ghent. A museum that reached out to make better connections with the city of Ghent. A museum that was able to store and show more collections and tell more stories of Belgian design culture. A museum that encouraged the work of young Belgian designers and those that were experimenting with the latest materials with an ecological emphasis. A museum which could fuse the work of young Belgian artists and designers into the very fabric of a new museum building. And a museum which encouraged new ways of engaging people from the city and beyond with an experience of design culture, going beyond the convention of the conventions of didactic traditional displays to spaces that could host events and festivals and encourage new audiences from the very young to the very old. But acknowledge that we can't keep carrying on enjoying what we're doing while the earth burns behind us, but instead create a building that demonstrated through its making itself that design could play a part in addressing the big challenges of our times, not least the climate crisis. Her vision was made mostly a decade ago, but experience has taught us that organizations and their buildings must be improvisational to the challenges that face them in designing a resilient museum. Similarly, architecture depends on so many things outside our control. Over this period, we've witnessed huge economic and political shocks within Europe that have affected how we can design and make buildings. And we're grateful for our European clients supporting us through this, some unfathomable choices our country has made. We've all collectively suffered through the period of COVID. Here's Ghent Railway Station with the advertisement banners of a blockbuster exhibition that was never able to open its doors. COVID has had a huge impact on the cultural sector and their institutional sustainability, which has also changed how we use their buildings. And the war in Ukraine has brought into precise focus our reliance on abundant material and energy resources, which we have had to totally refocus upon when making buildings. This has even made museum audiences expect more from their museums, how they are run and even where their collections are from. This conspiracy of circumstances has made us improvise in our design process from the original competition and helped shape the value judgments about how we make, my make a museum that is fit to face the future from an elemental level of the building components themselves. Beginning with the existing buildings and what we have to hand, this view is taken from within the existing courtyard garden. The building on the left, Hotel de Koenig, has been carefully restored and will be retained. The building on the right is the 1992 extension behind a facade rebuilt, and this will be reused. The facade in the middle, which, link, which links the two, conceals the gap plot and which will be reinvented. The 1992 extension has some grand ideas about public space linking gallery experiences. In reality, this has turned the entire museum into one compartment, which risks the collection in terms of fire and is an acoustic nightmare in terms of exhibition experiences. Rubbish as it is, it must be retained because of the way it is built with carbon intensive in situ concrete, which is strong but inflexible. So we will work with what we have got 
remove the staircase and void and make compartmented floors, which will give 50% more area to the museum, providing curatorial and conservation flexibility and create different gallery spaces on the, each floor with more space for permanent collections as well as exhibitions. The concept for the new building is a taller form whose roofscape fits in with the roof forms of the ad hoc medieval context and whose internal organization in the taller form mastering the surrounding buildings does all the heavy lifting for the entire museum. For the first time in the museum's history, it will have a passenger and art lift that links all floors. This will enable the museum organizationally to act as a loop around the garden, linking buildings of all periods together, and whose spatial idea is to connect the street to the courtyard with a single room per floor so that the visitor orientation of the new museum is super clear and the museum can enjoy good levels of daylight and fresh air throughout. External spaces between the old and the new buildings will form pocket gardens, also display spaces for design culture. The ground floor of the new building will be the new entrance, which links the entrance space with the re retained facade to the garden and reveal the new vertical circulation that links all levels for the museum, uh, of the museum for the first time. Hotel de Koenig will be less, left as a series of historic interiors. 1992 wing will be enlarged on all levels to increase capacity and exhibition flexibility. Husleyton from 1577 will provide a cafe and visitor hospitality space for the first time and a series of gardens that percolate the plan are also key rooms in the experience of the museum. The courtyard garden becomes the main orientation point of the entire museum. And the upper floors have a series of unique rooms which take their character from the inc incidental geometries of the site shape and whose windows frame specific views of the city beyond. New spaces will include a lecture theatre and education rooms for the first time and a series of characterful, flexible show spaces. And a city room which crowns the building and looks out in each direction to the wider city. You see the building and the building sees you. The exaggerated scale of the windows and balconies at higher level accentuate its civic purpose over the surrounding domestic historic architecture. And in the basement, a conservation lab and open, open archive for seeing more of the collection. Access to the breadth and depth of the collection is something we are finding that other cultural clients are providing their visitors, such as this gallery for the British Library within a fully automated low energy archive for over 8 million books of the national collection. Once you have taken great care of a collection, you must find ways of making it accessible. Form and materials. We've spoken about organizational and spatial character, which is indivisibly conceived with the form of the building and the structure and materials which make it. We've carefully considered what a cultural building costs, not only financially, but in terms of its environmental impact of its component parts. Just like the Hill House box, two con significant components, the structure and the external envelope. Be beginning with the structure, it was originally imagined as a concrete frame at the competition stage, but it has been redesigned as timber. This is not only for the sake of embodied carbon, but also with the intention of building in the tradition of Gentian architecture of timber and brick. So the new museum gains the structure and spatial character of a huge Gentian merchant's house. And the envelope also responds to the vernacular technology of brick, but in an unusual way. The brick form is exper experienced at many different scales of the city simultaneously. It becomes a, a new white figure on the composition of the city skyline, 
In the foreground, the brick and rendered grand houses facing the River Lee. In the background, the Gravenstein, one of the oldest stone landmarks in Ghent. This is a photograph taken on a recent visit to Ghent of the foot of one of the stone buttresses of St. Bavo Cathedral. The soft white limestones have been used to build and rebuild and rebuild the cathedral in its various manifestations from Romanesque church to high Gothic landmark that we see today. The white limestone has been used and reused as a precious material resource for representational land and landmark buildings throughout the whole city of Ghent. The use and reuse serves as a reminder that a circular economy of materials in buildings that we hear so much about today is certainly not a new idea. We were inspired by the use and reuse of this precious material and considered how we might do the same for this new public building for the Design Museum Ghent. Our instinct that it should be a brick building, a white brick, but how should we find this brick? Or indeed, should we invent a new one? Bricks typically have an enormous environmental cost. They excavate clay from the ground and then scorch it to make it strong enough to use in construction. These are the normal materials and processes that constitute the formula of, of a regular brick. And yet we wanted to use materials already close to hand, if possible from carefully processed sources uh, and waste streams from the site, uh, the demolition of the site itself. Rather than baking the brick, we wanted to use a curing process with a hydrated lime to harden the recipe and use the ingredients from the city of Ghent itself. We experimented with the recipe of the brick to give it different appearances and whose marginal differences would give, also give different characters to the overall form of the building as well. All of the ingredients of the recipe are sourced within eight kilometers of the site. They are hyper-locally sourced. It's a particular quality of the Belgian recycling culture that their waste streams are of the exceptional quality. Nevertheless, the process of selecting high-quality waste streams has been subject to extreme scrutiny and regulations. The new brick has to subscribe to stringent standards and regulation of conventional bricks, compressive strength, frost resistance, and so on. After 18 months or so uh, of research and testing, we have certification for a recipe we're happy with. The final recipe reduces embodied carbon, um, reduces embodied carbon bricks in as many ways we possibly can. It is under a third of the carbon of a regular brick. By virtue of its hyperlocal waste streams and form and from its hydrated lime curing process. The brick hardens in 100 days to construction strength and then will be continue to sequester carbon for the next 100 years. The brick and other building components around the ground floor slab will be will include the carefully selected demolition debris of, from the construction site. The final proportions of the brick are going to be made very special because their dimensions are made to match the bricks that we are removing from the Hotel de Koenig building on the right, which dates to 1755. And the brick will be partially made from the concrete, also from the 1992 demolition spoil. Within an overall plan, there is a margin of improvisation for works on site. Earlier this month, a 12th century wooden house was found in the mud in the location where the open archive will be eventually built. The bricks are now being manufactured at an industrial scale. 100,000 will be needed for the new building. And there will be a brick festival in an old warehouse near the site where the people of the city will be involved and be able to imprint their name onto individual bricks. The bricks will be made of the city by the people of the city for a new building for the city. So what have we learnt making a new hyperlocal hyper building material? It can almost 
almost perform to the standard materials, which are designed to be used everywhere and anywhere, but it is a little softer than a normal brick. So what does this mean? Um, it's made us reflect on material culture and on the material cult of modernism, where materials like Macintosh's concrete render were invented and engineered to be used anywhere. And yet Macintosh avoided at his peril the wisdom of vernacular architecture and its tried and tested materials and details. It's made us think about this softer material requiring more forgiving detailing. Unlike the Hill House that has eschewed copings and eaves for the image of the architecture, our building will have exaggerated weathering detail that throws water away from exposed areas of softer brick. Window sills and copings have a similarly exaggerated treatment. Window shutters are also provided to give solar shading to the very large scale civic windows. And the exaggerated construction details give the building a presence in foreshortening when viewed from different approaches. Getting approval to use this brick has not been easy and made us reflect also on why we build with the products we do in, in today's construction culture. The materials, we are use, the materials we use are regulated to outperform their locale, but as a consequence use more energy to make them than they really need. But energy was cheap when they were regulated. <clears throat> to bring innovation to the construction industry, we either need to cut the regulations or realize that there needs to be new regulations for sustainable building materials. In order that they can make marginal gains in the energy it typically makes, it typically, typically takes to make our regular building materials. Towards these next steps, we've been working with a design exchange partnership born out of Imperial College London to make our next generation of bricks. Ceratec, who are essentially chemical engineers, have invented a substitute material for cement, magcarb, magnesium carbonate, which is created parasitically through the cement making process itself. So it can be made in huge abundance. By using this, we might be able to replace the only remaining relatively high carbon ingredient in currently in the brick, the hydrated lime. And with Ceratec, we are also with experimenting with other ingredients and admixtures in the recipe to give different qualities to the brick performance, including seaweed, which is also highly abundant and ecologically regenerative to give it more water and therefore frost resistance. We will not be ready for the museum project, but hopefully for future projects. By taking care of matter at a construction unit scale, we can give the museum's architecture a unique quality and a building that can take care of its collections and visitors into the future. Thank you. Much, some questions, please. All of my students are hiding. So this means I have to ask the question? Oh my god. Um, so this kind of, I'm sitting here thinking about this last story that you told about the brick. Would you tell the same kind of story in the UK? For me, this basically um, has a sort of um, Belgian, like quality of what the kind of Belgian architecture scene currently is um, as a kind of nostalgia for this kind of materiality and love for the brick. And I was wondering if you could maybe just put that a little bit more into its con, well, reflect a little bit more into its context about, you know, um, yeah, how you think about that materiality in relation to uh, the place itself. Yeah, our, our local architect, Atoma, began the collaboration by saying uh, a Belgian is, is born with a brick in his belly. Um, so, you know, 
they do brick buildings. Um, we wanted this building to fit a sense of um, continuity, physical continuity with, with the place. You know, the museum and its buildings have kind of grown from the buildings, the historic buildings, and we wanted to evolve this site with a sense of context physically and materially. So brick felt brick and timber felt a natural way to to build this building. I, I think, you know, the the first story is highly contrasted um, to to this. It responds to a different kind of series of circumstances. So um, I think I think it's it's through a lot of conversations about how to build in, in this context with our local partners, but also the, the sensitivities of, of thinking about how a building might belong long term in this in this place. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Um, Construction is risk averse and and cost averse, and um, you know your story at the beginning of Macintosh taking a risk and losing the bed in a way, um, you know brings into focus the the risk that you're taking. So, and I and I was interested in what. Well, I was interested in whether you could reflect a bit on those questions, which are so much part of the way that contemporary construction is managed mm. and procured, mm. and in a way, what part the client plays, and how you've persuaded the client. I mean, just to qualify the question a bit, I thought it was fascinating at the beginning that you said it was um, cheaper after three years not to yeah. hire the scaffolding. And so, you know, immediately cost comes into the kind mm. of design calculation that mm. you're making. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the process of engaging the client in quite fundamental material research yeah. um, for a building that they're investing in in the long term. Well, first of all, our, our client is um, a public client. So they're, you know, they're expenditure from the public purse is publicly accountable. So they have very stringent levels of scrutiny about how and what you can use in making a building, um, including its ingredient materials. We have two sides to our client. We have the design museum and we have the city developer, Sogent, um, who are responsible for the delivery of the project. Um, the opportunity to investigate this new material actually fell out of the extended period of time that COVID and, and so on and so forth provoked on this project. If, if you were to look at the original program, we would have opened the museum already by now with a conventional brick that we would have specified, selected, and built with. Um, during this period of prolongation, we procured a uh, very generous grant from Circular Flanders who uh, incentivize environmental research. So with that, we, we um, engaged uh, lots of different specialists uh, from material scientists uh, to artisanal makers, um, and um, also legislation specialists as well, and material testing laboratories. So we went through a period of um, hundreds of tests of this material to come up with uh, data that would reassure our public client that this material is worthy of a public building and it will, be, it will last. So we have that, that risk mitigated, in a sense, because we have data <laughs> that someone can evaluate. Um, and we have, on the other hand, a client in the design museum who is pushing innovation and research. And so we're, you know, we're, the, the motive force of this project was, was um, 
enabled by a conspiracy of extra time, extra research budget, and a compulsion to investigate materials that challenge the status quo in a, in, in a, in a way that design for a design museum can address the some of the problems that we all face as a collective future. So, yeah, I, but I agree, you know, risk is the enemy of innovation. Hello, um, here. Maybe in continuation of that answer, viewers, um, I'm from China, and I think I, after ex, uh, understanding what you have done or the circumstances that allows this kind of more sustainable way of building architecture, like if I were to summarize it, for me, it's one, it's the, uh, one thing is what you said about the risk. In a way, like you have to do it that the high uh, energy cost, the circumstance allows the mindset of the clients and the architects to do the same. And then also, um, then my question is actually, maybe it's more a back and forth. It's about if in the, circumstance of a country like China, which is, you can say the cost of energy is way cheaper. And then I would say that this understanding of being more sustainable is less of an issue. Whereas I would say that also it's still, it needs to be a global effort for a overall architecture discourse to push for the sustainable or a, lo um, a collective effort to make the buildings less damaging to its environment. Then what I would ask is, what do you think are, in your opinion, the um, maybe infrastructure and or certain criteria, or what are the things that we need to push for in order for this environment to happen in an environment that is not facing this um, necessity in a way? I, I I think that we're, we're trying to find the question in each project on how we can, how we can make mar marginal gains here and there. I don't think we're going to solve the climate crisis with one thing or another in, in any of our projects, but we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to find the marginal gains where we can along the way. Um, we're, we're not being kind of preachy about that. We're not being... We're not, um, we're not selfishly keeping that recipe for ourselves. Once this is, once the burden of proof of this building has completed the the project and 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 it's successful, then that can be an open source recipe. Um, it, it's qualified by uh, in that particular situation. The the the, the recipe is so highly calibrated with with the stuff that you put in it. Even though it's waste streams, it's got to be really good waste streams. So um, it's, um, but but I I think I think first and foremost, it was motivated by cry, trying to trying to find the question of what this brick building should become. What was going to sort of uh, unlock those architectural questions, and then what how to make a brick and what does how does a brick perform in its construction and over its lifespan and how um, how we can reveal other kind of themes and research through that making okay thank you hi there um, so I'm struck then in many of your work, both the, the two that you presented tonight, but also m many of your earlier works as well, that there's a improvisational quality to, you know, largely taking one material or one building technique and extrapolating upon it. And particularly in, in the two projects that you spoke about tonight, that there was, as you, you know, um, uh, elaborated on, that there's a quality of experimentation and working with um, outside partners, chemists, you know, engineers, and whatnot. And I'm curious to know if within your own practice and with your own designers uh, in your office, if there's um, a certain uh, self-reflection that your role and what it means to be an architect has uh, similarly 
perhaps departed or sort of evolved away from the more sort of normative or conventional understanding of what it means to be an architect in a certain uh, 21st century context. Um, yeah, I guess I'm you know, hoping if you could just maybe speak about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, we, um, speaking personally, I, I was inspired to study architecture to design and make buildings. Um, I think the the territory of the territory of the the profession has kind of shifted in many ways. It's you know it's it's sort of disintegrated itself into into the kind of um, the realms of uh, or, or devolved into other kind of specialisms. So we're 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 sort of uh, in control of less, I guess now. But uh, I think in equal ways, I think the 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 training of being an architect has equipped equipped all of us with 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 different um, methods of operating as as design practitioners so you know we we whilst whilst as uh as our practice gets older we perhaps you know arguably are doing more conventional commissions we um we still make buildings and objects and deal with issues of land use and planning i mean the brick itself is throwing up questions of um Sort of planning and resource uh, land resource, uh, for example, <clears throat> how how materials are kind of being sourced hyper locally is is good in one way, but to make this brick, you need an awful lot of space to lay them out and and cure the bricks. So, so that conception of making something, you know, the size of a brick, has to encapsulate a almost a conception of kind of planning policy, how you're going to repurpose certain parts of the city temporarily for laying off space and curing 100,000 bricks. So um, I, I think the, 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 the professional territory of architecture is a bit more... <laughs> It's a bit more liberal and dispersed than it perhaps was when I started to train as an architect. Thank you. Uh, thank you for presenting. Uh, my question was, uh, I would like to know the what is the, you know, like, difference of cost in producing these bricks apart from using concrete because like at the end sometimes if someone wants to make a house they'll go for the cheaper option and they'll go again use the concrete so how cost effective also this bricks can be compared to the conventional methods of construction um this particular brick uh yeah the ones which are yeah in this particular brick is uh the same price as a regular quality clay brick there's no cost difference it's a it's a very thrifty economic building this every element of the bu building is measured under scrutiny for its affordability so um so whilst we've had research grants um for the gestation and uh um uh the making of this brick as a project, um, the brick itself can be no more affordable than a regular cl clay brick. So, uh, Thank you for your lecture. I was fascinated by your interest in work in the fabrication of materials with new properties, which is related in the greater field of biosynthetic materials. I was curious, what is your attitude towards the general work being produced at the moment as a result of this collaboration between architecture and this field around the world? I mean, I guess I've stressed this um, uh, material and making component of this. You know, I, 
the, the subject of the lecture is to question, you know, I guess this softer future of taking care of matters. Um, I think that I think that this this solution is not going to be applicable to every building um, question, and we have to find different questions in different projects uh, that yield unconventional or unexpected solutions in different ways. But but they've got to be led by an architectural idea, first and foremost. Thank you. And just to follow, I guess, some mm. architects prefer to design furniture to complement their architecture. You made your own brick. And do you consider that move as a return to some origins of architecture to the point when architects question not just form or design method, but also materiality and market or architectural materials? And what were your references on that way, if there were such? I, th I think... Um I mean, I think this this particular project's made make us made us focus on the process of making things. There are other projects in the studio that we're doing at the moment which make us focus on different topics because they might be at a different scale. So, you know, certain projects might focus on a suspicion of abstraction in architecture. Uh, buildings which, like distribution centers that are so abstract, they've abstracted our, 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 our cities, our, our towns, the, the centers, they've abstracted the uses from our towns and um, city centers. They're abstract because they don't have the conventional grammar of um, normal uh, buildings, uh, windows and doors, and they're abstract because you don't know what's inside them. And we're doing, we're doing um, we're doing a project for an archive which takes on all of those issues and, and there, are different, there are different questions at stake in the project than the, the things that are close to hand and palpable in material terms. And yet, as I said in one of the topics, this idea of intimacy at scale to, to, to make sure that there isn't a disengagement through this kind of abstraction, this thin-skinned abstraction of, of designing and building nowadays. Um, we're, we're trying to, f you know, we're, as, we, as we get different projects, we're trying to find different architectural questions within the project. Not all the projects are projects that, you know, you would think automatically you could find a cultural or an architectural question in. Um, not all projects you would think are, are attractive commissions to take on um, in architectural terms, but we are we're optimistic. Even even from those first two projects I showed, the the pavilion on the roof and the and the civilian disaster memorial. These these are all projects that we were we were guided against by our friends and peers. They you know they they shouldn't be projects that we should take on, but. For, for, for um, commercial reasons or political reasons or public relations reasons, and yet there was something fascinating on the margins of conventional architecture where we could find an architectural question in the project to get our teeth into. Um, thank you for your lecture. Um, I think I have two questions. Uh, one is that um, what kind of mortar that did you use to keep the bricks together and if the walls were plastered on the interior, what kind of plaster was used? And why I'm asking this question is also to understand how you answer the balance between authenticity and adaptability on such historic sites in the process of innovating new products for construction. Uh, so you're referring to the, the the Macintosh Hill House, yeah? Uh, no, to the 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 new bricks that uh, were developed. Right. Okay. So, so so it's a it's a timber superstructure, and uh, mass timber finish on the inside of of the new building, and a brick exterior. So that, strictly speaking, apart from some exhibition walls, 
um, there are going to be no there are going to be no plaster surfaces. Um, really, it, not in the not in the conception of the the spatial idea of the building anyway. It's not to say that that can't take on its own life over time and and the building will adapt over time, but but technologically there's there's no shortcomings of the construction that you would prevent you from making the inside out of any material you want really and in fact in fact the the museum director is actually encouraging young Belgian designers that are working with material innovation to um, to fuse their material research into the building spaces themselves so that the our building kind of is a framework or a backdrop for sort of a laboratory of ideas by young Belgian designers. So it's, it's, it's going to be continually hacked, I guess, inside. Um, I had another question about the Macintosh house. Yep. Um, I was wondering whether you could elaborate a bit about the size of the box that you uh, designed. Because I think it's interesting that because it derived from the scaffolding, um, but the size is completely different. So there was this picture where they, again, installed the scaffolding. Um, so that was one part of the question. But then also, uh, I think it's interesting how it becomes like this completely different universe to experience the building. So even that it uh, encloses the gardens uh, and those kinds of things. So um, yeah, so I was just mainly my question is like, what? how did you define like the... The we, size of the box. We wanted to have the absolute minimum footprint on the site possible. The, the landscape gardens by Margaret MacDonald are really quite exquisite. A scaffold would have decimated that, so we, we made a, a steel structure that stiletto healed down onto some tiny little pad foundations, um, uh, which had slightly submerged under the, under the uh, landscape. Very, very minimized, completely minimized. Um, so the footprint of the new steel box is set by a safe working region around the house of about five meters. And also kind of there's a bit of judgment in, <laughs> in creating the minimized box from key views Macintosh intended the house to be visible from. So there's a sort of picturesque quality to composing the structure as well as a very, very pragmatic one. But the steel structure is the absolute fewest pieces and kilograms of steel we could possibly get away with. After the end of its life, it's all unboltable and completely recyclable or taken to another asset and repurposed like that. Thank you. Um, my question is also about the Macintosh house and about the theme of permanence. Um, you mentioned this kind of couple of dilemmas um, that you were well, provoking probably the visitors to think about. One of them, the use of the materials. Yep. And then you said, maybe the box stays there forever. So I was wondering, what would be your stance if... Um, Thank thankfully, that's not my dilemma. <laughs> um, I, I think it's um, it's the National Trust for Scotland. Have a, I mean, a, a really interesting conundrum on their hands. You know, with four times the amount of visitors than they had had before the box went up. That's four times the amount of receipts for tickets for a charity. That's four times the amount of interest in Charles Rennie Macintosh. Um, at what point do you take the box away? Well, first of all, you can't take the box away until you've decided on how to repair it, I think. Otherwise, it will quickly disintegrate, and the box will have been worth nothing. Um, so you make a repair of some description. Then you take the box away. Does the repair use materials like Macintosh originally intended for issues of, you know, conservation authenticity or does it invent new materials that emulate the look of the original hill house but are not that um, so those are that's you know the, the whole problem was around that debate 
for 40 years, and no one made the decision and was just stood at the edge of the garden looking at this house deteriorating. What our project does is it sort of halts, it stops that clock and halts the decay, the, the decay. and then that concept conversation, philosophical and practical conversation about what they do next can ensue. Um, at what point that's concluded and completed, and at what point we want to see Macintosh Hill House again as a singularity, um, thankfully that's not my dilemma. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for the lecture. I was sort of taken a bit by how you framed both of those projects in sort of the lens of sustainability, but also how they're both very much spaces for display, um, both, I guess, of the house and of the collection in Ghent. And then, yeah, I was very taken when you said about the expression of the capping and of you know the specific details that need to go along with this new sustainable brick. Um, and I was wondering if that's something that comes into your practice very often consciously is sort of the, the aesthetic allure, because they're two very beautiful projects that goes along with this new wave of sustainability that do you think about the aesthetic that comes with these monumental important sort of sites and buildings? I think we're interested in making things and looking at the way things were made with hands and tools and materials over time and looking to the, the wisdom of kind of how certain techniques have evolved, I guess. So, so having a fascination with the way buildings are made and how we're going to make buildings is central to that. I think it would be very, very difficult to ignore issues of um, our, our duty as a, as a very violent um, infliction on, on um, ecological resources and energy in construction and in use. I think we, you know, we wear many hats as architects, don't we? we uh, and one of those hats, um, one of those uh, new hats is, um, you know, with an interest in, in the long-term protection of, of our planet. Um, it, it, it's not as though it's, it's an it's a add-on in the process. It's, it's kind of, it's fundamental, but also if you, if you return to kind of these kind of pre-modern ways of doing and making, it, it was also embedded in the value judgments of how things were made before we started engineering things to do anything anywhere. So I think that is the thing that we've, that's the outcome from the Macintosh project, looking at, looking at this absolute a wonderful masterpiece of design, but seeing seeing those sort of tipping points of where things go right and go wrong through construction and and working like-mindedly with construction. Um, and to Daniel's point earlier, you know, we can't we can't um, as artistic, aesthetic, environmental practitioners avoid our duty of care to risk and longevity and things working well. It's, it's all part of the, the mixture of things that we have to, um, you know, kind of <laughs> synthesize and, 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 and balance. Great. Thank you very much.